the creator and host of one of the most popular storytelling shows and podcasts on this planet. Please give a very warm welcome to Kevin Allison. I was going to say that, uh, you know, oddly enough, tonight there is, I have maybe the least amount of penis in my story. <laughs> Very, uh, but that's because this predates all of that. This starts at recess in the first grade. <laughs> it's indoor recess, and there's about 50 kids running around throwing balls back and forth, and I am just looking at all the dinosaurs painted on the walls and kind of loving them, and I'm kind of wedged away in a corner having a conversation with an imaginary friend. And it occurred to me as I was coming here tonight, I was like, wow, if I was with my therapist right now, we could just stop right there. We could just spend the next hour on the fact that all the kids are playing with one another. I'm talking to someone who doesn't exist in the corner, says a lot about me to this day. But a little kid comes up to me, this kid who looked a little bit like a first grade version of Paul McCartney. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, oh, uh, I'm talking to my friend. He said, who? I said, oh, it's, it, it's my friend Henry. He's like, well, what is he? I was like, actually, he's a piano. <laughs> And the two of us instantly thought that was the funniest damn thing ever. We're like, what? You're talking to an imaginary piano? <laughs> so we laughed and laughed, and we were just instantly the best of friends. And we got, you know how things evolve with jokes? We suddenly started calling each other Henry instead of the piano. And soon enough, we were known to be the best of friends in the first grade, so we decided, wait a minute, we have got to start the Henry Club. If you want to be friends with Henry and Henry, you have to be in the hierarchy. You can be a three-quarters Henry, <laughs> or a half Henry, or a one-quarter Henry, or a pineapple. I don't know what that meant. <laughs> But the people who were pineapples felt it was a very demoralizing position. <laughs> so we just went on being the best of friends right up through all of grade school. We became the kind of guys who would like hang out all night as we got kind of older and would talk about things like, you know, what is God? I think it's more of a verb than a noun. You know, those kind of conversations that you have. <laughs> We would listen to Jesus Christ Superstar and Fiddler on the Roof, and when Indiana Jones came out, we would run around the backyard acting like we were on horses together. So we were truly like soulmates. We were really best friends. But the movie E.T. ruined all that. <laughs> In 1982, I was 12 years old, and you see, there is something I had not told Henry. There is something I had not told anyone, anyone in my life, my entire life. It was my big, big secret. I knew it even when I was that little kid praying in the photograph there. And that is, I knew, when I was five years old, I saw the butt of the boy next door, and I realized, Oh no, I like boys' butts. <laughs> it was a very, very visceral and very conscious thought. It was like right there. I had heard the kids in the neighborhood use the words gay and fag, and it had been explained to me that those words meant two things. One, they meant horribly lame and defective and awful and laughable and loathsome and a boy who likes boys. And essentially, they're synonymous. So I knew, even at five, oh my God, I am both of those things. It was a terrifying thing to grow up knowing. I was raised in a very, very Catholic, very, and Cincinnati is very, very Republican uh, environment. So I grew up very terrified and was not sure if I could ever tell anyone this. And if I thought, if there's anyone that maybe, maybe someday I might be able to tell, it was Henry, right? 
Then the movie E.T. came out. <laughs> and you see, I had been trying to deny this to myself for years and years. At 11, at age 11, I came up with a plan. I was like, look, maybe if I talk about this in church, if, if I talk about, you know, not say the word gay or fag or anything like that, but kind of like wedge my way into it in a confession booth with a priest, maybe he can like talk it out of me in retrospect now that we'll all we know about the Catholic Church and that sort of thing. I'm so glad I didn't take that tactic. <laughs> in a tiny little room with a priest. Uh, so I didn't. I didn't go to confession, but I couldn't quite say it out loud to myself, and then E.T. came out, and I sat there watching this movie, and if you don't... Now, E.T. is not officially a movie about romantic love, but it sure was to me because I fell in love with this kid, Elliot, the lead boy in the movie, was right about my age at that time, and something about him just struck me so palpably. If you remember, in the beginning of the movie, he is desperate for a best friend. He doesn't have any friends. They're kind of, I think, new in the neighborhood or something like that, and his father has died, so he doesn't really have a, a male figure, and he just wants a best friend. He just kind of feels out of place. And then he finds this best friend, who is, of course, a strange brown thing from outer space. And they develop this soulmate thing, and I just found myself kind of romantically tied up, and, and, and like, identifying with the brown thing, right? So at the end of the movie, when they're splitting up, I was just sobbing and sobbing and sobbing like much more than anyone else in the theater because I don't know, I just felt like this was a love story that only I got on some level. So the very next day, I had my E.T. novelization, right? And I'm reading it in the backyard, and I realize that I come to this point where I'm just so overwhelmed by this description of the guy, Elliot, in the movie that I, I just had to close the book, and I said out loud to myself, that's it, I am gay. I said it out loud to myself. Now... About a month or so later, there was this incident where there was a water fight in my, in my backyard with me and the boys next door and everything, and we had to go down in the, in the basement and take all our clothes off, and there was some truth or dare, and show me yours, I'll show you mine, and yada, yada. And it was just, you know, kind of innocent, what kids do, but, it, but I thought it was a lot of fun. <laughs> And so there came a day where Henry and I were swimming in the swimming pool across the street from his house, his neighbor's swimming pool. And I found myself, like, without really thinking it through, telling him about how fun this thing was with the, what had happened with, you know, the truth or dare with the kids next door. And he kind of reacted like, uh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then I felt like, oh, I, I really have kind of opened the door just a little bit here. I, I have kind of left it ajar just a little bit, haven't I? And, and I felt like, I don't know, let's just, let's just do this. Let's just get this over with. And, and the movie E.T. came up because uh, he had just seen it again. And I said, you know, when I saw E.T., I think I, I felt differently about that movie than a lot of people did. And he was like, huh? And I said, well, I, I think that the boy, Elliot, in the movie, I think I felt differently about him. And it was just such a loaded moment because he knew what I was saying. I hadn't really said it, but he knew what I was saying. And there was just this awkward silence between us. We're about 10 feet away from each other in the pool. He starts to get out of the pool. And as he's walking away, he just says kind of like under his breath in my direction, you're sick. And I get out of the pool and we kind of like silently walk down the hill toward where our bikes are and I'm kind of drying off and we really don't say anything to each other. The day is over and 
And I just kind of like go on my way. And then the next Monday at school, we're on the playground and I notice that he keeps picking on me, right? He keeps like pointing out ways that I'm wrong about this and I'm wrong about that and I said such and such. And it came to the point where we were in health class. This is a seventh grade. We were in health class and I said something on the playground about pelvises. I said, <laughs> only boys have pelvises. Uh, and he was like, no, that is not true. The pelvis is a part of everybody's skeleton. And I was like, oh, well, you're so perfect. And he was like, oh, I'm perfect. I'm so perfect. He said, maybe you would know a little bit more about girls having pelvises if you weren't so focused on the boys next door. And at that point, I just kind of whipped around and, and I was just kind of blind in, in, in kind of a fury and, and just emotion. And I said the only thing I could think to say in that moment, which was, bitch. <laughs> and I kind of instantly knew, oh gosh, even that was really gay. <laughs> <laughs> But he walked away from me on the playground, and when we lined up, we, you know, we would ordinate a single file line back into school. He, didn't, he was nowhere near me. We were usually right next to each other. And I knew that we were no longer talking to each other. And pretty soon, all of St. Catherine's grade school knew that the Henrys were not talking to each other. Because over the years, we had become two of the most popular kids in school. Like the Henry Club <laughs> was quite, quite a, an organization at that point. People needed to choose sides. And it was really, really tense for a lot of our friends and even some of our teachers. Our teachers were concerned like, oh gosh, these two aren't friends anymore? So it was really, really harsh. I have so many journal entries about it. And there was a lot of pining to, for our friendship. There was a lot of looking at each other and trying not to look at each other and you know, making jokes and realizing, oh, that's a joke that I would make with him ordinarily. It doesn't go over so well when there's not someone to you know, join in, you know. So it was really painful. And it lasted for a year and a half. Now, at the end of seventh grade, it was time for student council to run for president, right? And so awkwardly enough, amazingly enough, only two people end up signing up to run for student council president. Both of us. <laughs> So it's kind of like Henry versus Henry. It's this showdown, and we both find out at the same time, oh, no, go oh, great, now we're up against each other. Well, I'll tell you what. Stickers started showing up. These little white handwritten stickers would find their way onto desks or on walls next to desks or under chairs that, would, that were saying, Kevin Allison is a bisexual. I think he was just hedging his bets. <laughs> but it was a smear campaign, right? I was being swift boated But you know what? I had so much enthusiasm and was going after the student council thing in such a, oh, I don't know, such a rah-rah sort of way. When it came time, the big day for the big speeches in front of everybody, which is kind of like debates of sorts, he got up and gave his big speech, and it was really impressive. It was really smart, really political. It was very effective. It was like, I guess, a Hillary Clinton kind of speech of, oh my gosh, yeah, he could really get some things done. And I got up and I decided, well, I don't have the same sort of substance as him, so I'm going to go for some gusto here. I'm going to do something really colorful. So I got up there. And there was this phrase that everyone got the hugest kick out of in whatever that was, <laughs> whatever year that was. In seventh grade was about 1982, right? I got up and I said, when I say cool, you say beans. Cool, beans, cool, beans. And I just did that for a little while and then left. I won that thing in a landslide. <laughs> <laughs> I had apparently put my finger on the cool beans zeitgeist. 
1982. But I'll tell you, the next year, eighth grade, it was just eating at us more and more. And it was awkward because it was a small school. So they'd keep putting us in these groups that would have to go on field trips together or stuff like that where, you know, we would find that we would make jokes deliberately that we knew only the other one would get. You know, we, you could tell that we both kind of wanted, it was kind of like, you know, like Sam and Diane on Cheers where you're waiting, at, you know, season after season. Okay, when are they finally going to get together? That's what the ending of this enemy ship was like for the two of us. So finally, a day came toward the very end of eighth grade where I handed out awards to everyone. I just took it upon myself to give everyone in the eighth grade an award for something. And it was just a big list that everyone got on mimeographed paper. And for Henry, it was best guy who is actually a pretty good guy, but probably maybe wouldn't even want to be receiving an award from someone like me. <laughs> so finally, the day came where I think enough of I, my parents and my friends had just been saying, this is kind of tired. This is kind of old. You know, like, why don't you just push past this? Like, you guys are good guys. And so I was creating a radio drama. Even back then, I used to do these things with my little Radio Shack tape recorder. I was making a, a, a horror comedy called I Was a Teenage Doorknob. <laughs> <laughs> it was a radio drama where people are being attacked by giant monstrous doorknobs. And I needed a final number in the whole piece. It was about a half hour long thing and it was gonna end with a song uh, based on the tune of Oklahoma. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, my old friend who used to listen to musicals with me would be such a help on putting this song together. So I actually picked up the phone and when he answered, I said, ah, uh, well, I actually called him Bob. I called him his real name, you know, and like, like, let's not get carried away here with the intimacy. So I said, hey, Bob. <laughs> it was like the first time I'd called him that uh, ever. And I said, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, making this funny radio thing with the tape recorder and uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, you could come over and with some of the other guys if you want, I guess. <laughs> And he did, he came on over. And so that afternoon, there we were singing and laughing and doing what we, what we were doing on the very first day we ever met, just inventing crazy stuff and laughing with each other again. And there was a lot to talk about, but for that day, it was just laughing together again. And so what we had called the darkness <laughs> was over, and we never looked back. Thank you. Here comes the world. 